Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is the first day of the month, December 2022, 3 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time and 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And I'm giving the Eastern Time because today we have a very special guest. His name is Mr. Matthew Russell Lee. And uh, I'm very excited about him telling us about his um, work very fascinating and, and, and historically, politically important work on his beat, which uh, spans the United Nations. He got kicked out of the office there. I'll let him explain what happened there. And uh, quite an eye opener for me reading his books. And I'll show you very quickly. I have four or five of them now, and they're available at Amazon.com. I hope you'll pick them up. They're issued almost immediately after the events that he's covering. So Mr. Lee's also pioneering a new type of hybrid journalism that's going to, I think, alter the course of the way our news and analysis is being reported because we know that uh, dinosaur media is struggling right now, rightfully so, because they're not really providing the public service that they pretend to. But one of the, very quickly, I'm going to bring Mr. Lee on very, very momentarily here. Uh, Genocide Games of Gutierrez, and we'll explain, or Mr. Lee will explain who Gutierrez is um, in a stormy time. This is about the United Nations. It's going to be a real eye-opener for all of us. Belt and Road Killer. Mr. Lee has a penchant for puns, right, which also helps us mnemonically to uh, access these these events and I, I like them again. It's a, it's about the United Nations. I have one on the Glenn Maxwell case, but I don't know where it is right now. I probably took it to another room or something. And then this one here, I promise you, stay tuned to the very end because we're going to get into the trial that just concluded. Remember, these books are issued almost immediately, and this trial I think uh, concluded on um, October nineteenth, if I'm not mistaken, nineteenth or twentieth. It's called American Ugly. And those of you who have the cultural background know that it, he's Mr. Lee is alluding to American beauty, which if we have the time later, if Mr. Lee has to leave, I'll talk about some of the esoteric meaning behind Rosa American be beauty, right? And the um, subtitle is, uh, it's called American Ugly, Kevin Spacey Beats the Rap, another pun. Uh, but Dark Secrets Made Public in SDNY, that's Southern District of New York, live. With no further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I am happy to bring to you Mr. Matthew Russell Lee. Right. Great. Thanks a lot. I'm sorry for all the puns. I, 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 as I'm <laughs> writing the things, I try to come up with a, with a title. The more re I, I think an even more recent one, maybe one called Hydrogen Heist, about the trial of a... Um, of, of a guy who said he'd started a, a uh, hydrogen car company, uh, Nikola, named after Nikola Tesla. Anyway, Trevor, right. Nolan, so I covered that trial, so it's called Hydrogen Heist. So he sort of worked through a title for a while. I'm actually already working on one called uh, World Cup of Blood, so be on the lookout for that. That goes beyond the court to the uh, events in Qatar, but it does tie back into the United Nations. Okay, wonderful. Now, I wanted to, and, you know, I appreciate being punished. So don't worry uh -huh. about it. Keep them coming. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't read this. Uh, I got to find out about your background. What did you do your, your undergraduate work, Mr. Lee? Well, it, to me, I actually, am, I'm not a college graduate, but I'm a lawyer. So it's a little confusing. Uh, I, okay. I started college, then I left. Um, I went to work at a place called the Catholic Worker here in New York. Uh, it's like a, it's like a soup. People would call it a soup kitchen. They call it a house of hospitality. Then I became a, a homesteader, fixing buildings that were abandoned, both in, in the Lower East Side of Manhattan and in the Bronx. And in the course of that, of seeing kind of um, some legal problems that people had staying in their homes uh, mm -hmm. when they're fixing them up, even if even if they were nobody else wanted them, there were buildings all over the Bronx. Um, I ended up going to applying for law school, and they said, "Well, how can you go to law school if you're having graduated college?" But there was an exception that your life experience could replace, you know, up to x number of years of college so yeah. that's my 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 i always point that out because i don't i never want to get caught up in where it's implied that i finished college i did not finish college. Oh, okay. i am a, a nice school law graduate and can bring cases when necessary all right 
And that was from Fordham Law School. Is that That's correct? Right. Jake? Yeah, so I gave you a lot of, I mean, they gave me a scholarship. They also have, they're based in the Bronx. So I, I, I'm a huge, I'm a, I'm a rent. They, they, they make a lot of puns too, but I won't get into their, their mascot is the Ram. So I'm always right. getting emails now about their uh, Ram. Of, I can't even think of it, but, uh, you know. Now, just for the record, ben, you hold the Juris Doctorate, not the LLB. No, I didn't go that far. I, I don't even, to be honest, it's interesting now. Now I, co I cover the courts daily. I mean, well, to explain this this bar behind me, I'm in the fire mm -hmm. stairs of the Southern District of New York Courthouse. I'm really enjoying it. It's actually funny. When I first got the degree, I kept being an activist, fighting banks for redlining and environmental justice. Then I became a, more of a journalist covering the United Nations. I never knew it would come full circle. Well, now, like, I, I'm actually... I do filings with the courts to try to unseal documents in a lot of the cases that I fought, that I that I cover, and I've been given hearings, and they note that I'm not admitted. I'm admitted in this court. I'm not hiding out a shingle to charge people money, but I do fight for transparency using uh, my legal background. Well, I think we understand each other. I used to um, get, I used to subscribe to the Catholic Worker. All right. Uh, one cent per copy, and it was founded by Dorothy Day. And for people who are not aware, please check that out. Yeah, uh, and I understand. I can see that spirit of true social justice, not the fake one that we were being fed for the last couple of years, that comes through your work. So that's why I was interested in, um, in your your biographical background. So tell me, what is the layout at uh, SDNY? Is it like a uh, a glamorous newsroom or is it just a bunch of it is actually, it's, I'll, I'll tell you the truth it's, it's I've gone through I'll, I'll step back because I, I do want to I'll do the, tie the two things together okay. that, that it's, it is it's, 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 it's set up in cubicles I'll, I'll describe this and I'll go back and compare it to the UN which is even more glamorous but it's a real it's a real pit of vipers uh, that um, at SDNY it's there, there I've also covered Eastern District where it's not as good here at SDNY once you're sort of you get in, and I can explain how it works, they want they want to make sure that you're truly covering the court and not just you know covering one or two trials, no matter how much in depth. Um, you know there are cubicles. We have some. Uh, there, I look out the window, I can see Chinatown, Lower Manhattan. Uh, there, there's the best thing about it, from my point of view, is that they have uh, two Pacer terminals. Uh, Pacer is amazingly enough to cover the U.S. court federal court system. You have to pay for documents. This used to really hold me back. I mean, it's still as to some courts. And you can, there are ways around it, but basically the court system tries to charge 10 cents a page. So if you're really reading deeply into an extensive case, like the Maxwell case, for example, has, you know, thousands of filings, um, you really are going to want to get PACER. You can sign up for it and pay 10 cents a page. And some courts, different parts of the country, I will pay it to, on a very limited basis to look at documents. But here I can read everything I want from the case, including the transcripts, everything. So it really helps me. That's why I focus a lot on this court. And as, as luck has it, it does do a lot of financial crime cases. It has a lot of the big cases, but not all. So, you know, you can cover, I'm covering the DC federal court these days as well. Mm -hmm. Some of the January 6th cases and other antitrust and stuff like that. You know, what's so, so odd. I, I was surprised uh, my own reaction and reading your, your dispatches at least one per day, but sometimes oh, more okay. than that is that the court system is specifically SDNY seems to be working. I, I, I was actually really surprised. Absolutely. I, I, I'll jump forward a bit. I get in a lot of these cases, I get, I get, you know, and I respond to people. So, and I'm, and I, and I understand why people think the, the, the federal, at least the federal court system is, is a lot better than I thought it was before I came and took a close look at it. Yeah. And I don't mean to be, I'm not to whitewash anything. There's a lot of disparities in sentencing which I can give you a lot of examples of. But the thing that's amazed me is the, is the, the kind of seriousness with which the judges treat things. I mean, I think people think of federal judges as like dealing with weighty, they are dealing with weighty matters, but I would say 70% of their workload are crack cases and cases about, you know, a website was inaccessible under the ADA. Some of the civil litigation is a bit kind of, kind of routinized. Um, mm -hmm. but, but the, but the thing about, uh, about these criminal cases is that they're important. You're going to be putting people away for a long time. I mean, I, I've seen, I saw a guy today, plead, just now five o'clock plead guilty to selling crap as it was cocaine base, as they call it. Mm -hmm. And there's a big dispute. He pled guilty, but he doesn't yet know whether his sentence guideline is going to be 57 months or 188 months. That's an enormous difference. 
Mm-hmm. And it all rides on the legal determination of whether he's a career offender. The judge will have to weigh it out. But in a way, he's really rolling the dice by pleading guilty. Then again, he might think he's going to do much worse going to trial. But it's it's you, you see these lengthy sentencings. And I think that the judges really do take things seriously. And I do think also there's 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 more protections for defendants than you'd think. So it's just all in all, I find it very, very, you know, it's very heartening. Like in the, when when I'm at wit's end, I can find in the courthouse on, on different floors of it. It's like there's 26 floors, mm-hmm. uh, you know, four or five criminal proceedings going on at any one time. And with trials, I'll, I'll dip in a few times a day and see see what's mm-hmm. happening. But the best part, the best place in the courthouse is the magistrate's court, which is new where new criminal cases come in. And you really don't know what's what, what's coming in. You don't they don't announce in advance. There's, in fact, very few people covering it. So that's that's kind of what I first covered when I got here. I was like, I'm just going to like stay here like a fly on the wall. I've gotten to know, you know, the marshals, the judges. I used to complain a lot. And I, I now write about it rather than about, you know, kind of the lack of transparency. Like they'd read off a number really fast or the, the, the case wouldn't be put in pace or fast enough. But if you get into it enough, I think it's a very good kind of kind of finger on the pulse of things that are happening. And I, I think it's important to like, you know, people, a lot of the journalists here, are, they're looking for the big case. Everyone wanted to cover Glenn Maxwell. People wanted to cover cases about, about cases about Trump. But I think it's important if people are going to be serving 10 years, 20 years, somebody needs to be there to make sure, you know, that, that they're being treated fairly and they're not, that, that, that things are as they should be. So I, I enjoy it. I write about it. Some stories get more readership than others, but I, I think that there are some stories that are important to write about. Well, two examples drawing from your most recent work or, or fairly recent work, because you're always dropping new um, information here. But I read the one on Nicholas Trulia, who pled guilty for $20 million in crypto SM, you know. Wow. I didn't know about that, but but it's happening at SDNY. I don't know if it's an anomaly, but I, I'm assuming no, no, it's there happening. Are a lot of, there are a lot of, there are a lot of like, for example, and this, this one I have to say, I... I Sometimes I really go out of my way to just describe in detail what's happening with zero opinion. Um, in this one, I did I did a separate piece on Patreon, and I will say that I have a Patreon page that's Matthew Russell Lee, where I try to be a little bit more honest. Say that I again. It was troubling. It was troubling. It was it's patreon.com slash Matthew Russell Lee. And I think if you Google it, you can find it that way too. And it's it's like five dollars a month. But I try right. what I've started doing. Because I think it's important to be objective. I don't think you should just do opinion. In fact, I don't think it's one or the other. Maybe we'll get into that in terms of the books. Like, Mm -hmm. it's important. There was nobody else there. It's important to describe what happens in the sentencing. So if you go in with your mind made up, this is going to be, you know, a a, a sentencing disparity, money talks and bullshit walks, you're going to miss what actually happens. So I try and that's why I sometimes live tweet these things, because I just I just want to get the dialogue. What happens? What were the issues? What was what, what convinced the judge? But at the end of the day, I have to say, you know, it's not for me to say should, how much time should he do for stealing. What this guy did is he's a very smart computer guy. He and some co-conspirators bribed somebody at AT&T to get the password to somebody's phone. And then they managed to simulate their, uh, to s- do a SIM switch, appear that they had, they were, the, they were that phone and they stole $20 million in crypto. It's a lot of money. Yeah. And people like the guy that I saw today, he's selling dime bags of crack. He could do 188 months. This guy for stealing $20 million faced 51 to 63 months. But because he offered to pay a lot of the money back because he has the money because he stole it. Next thing you know, he got an 18 month sentence, 12 months of which he's already served. So he's going to serve six months for $20 million. Whereas a guy that goes into a store with a BB gun and holds it up, will do 10 years or 20 years. So I, 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 felt, I, I talked to the defense lawyer. I, mean, I'm not, I, don't, I don't blame him. It's his job to try to get as low a sentence as he could. Maybe I blame the judge in this instance, in the sense of having maybe more, more sympathy, more compassion for this misguided, you know, white collar defendant than for a, you know, perceived to be more violent or more different than him. Um, uh, you know, criminal with a gun, or criminal. With, but the disparity is, is a bit much, and so I decided to 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 to. Oh, I'll, I'll even compare it to another crypto case. There's a guy called Virgil Griffith. 
whose case I covered, who was a very smart guy. I, I, he worked for the Ethereum Foundation. He developed a lot of code. Um, he actually did, earlier developed a program to see who had changed Wikipedia pages to kind of sanitize information. So he's a smart coder. Mm -hmm. He gave a speech in North Korea and he was charged under sanctions law with violating mm -hmm. sanctions. I was ready to cover his trial. I would have definitely done a book about Virgil Griffith because I think it's a fascinating case. He pled guilty on the eve of trial and got like 40 something months. And today I couldn't help thinking he didn't do that for the money. I mean, whatever we may think of North Korea and whatever, I don't think he really helped them. It wasn't like he was like secretly in a boiler room helping them steal crypto to build nuclear weapons. He had this idea, he said, that, you know, information wants to be free or that if if North Korea could become part of the crypto world, maybe they'd act better. I don't know if I believe any of his ideas. Maybe they were very muddle-headed. But if he's going to do 47 months, I think a guy who just for the money of it stole 20 million should do the same. Mm -hmm. But that's not how it played out. Well, let's pivot, uh, use this case of Corey Yu, who's a citizen of Marshall I the Marshall Islands as a way to pivot to your experience at the United Nations, because your, your reportage has international diplomatic uh, implications as well. So I, could you talk a little bit about totally. the Corey? You I'll talk about case. that case and then I'll go back. But I think the way to do it, maybe I, I'll, I'll do it a little bit th this way. Okay. At a certain point, I was, a, I was the inner, inner city press existed initially as a, as a, as a physical newspaper. We would print it up at, at this, uh, you know, and, and initially on a mimeograph machine and distribute it. Through time, it became, it also went online because you can reach a lot more people and there's less costs and you can work a lot faster. You know, I, these days I can report, I already wrote a story about uh, uh, Mr. Yan's uh, sentence, guilty uh, plea, which took place today. But I went to cover the UN and initially I did it just the way I'm doing it here. And I, I hope to not have similar problems. This was a big concern of mine because. I just went in. I didn't go into the UN thinking it's a corrupt place or I'm going to, you know, I'm going there to uncover it. I just decided to go in and cover everything that I saw, follow things that led. And the more I wrote about it online, the more people sent me stuff. And, and not just opinion stuff like we don't like the UN or the UN should leave the US, but people in other countries would write in and say, like, I remember one, one of my favorite, er, favorite early stories was a guy whose kid was killed by a UN truck in Liberia. They used to have a big UN mission in Liberia because there had been a civil war. And when the UN drove over somebody's kid, they didn't pay anything. The UN told them, we're immune. You couldn't take them to court, nothing. So I took to asking the UN, what are you going to do for this family? And they said, this is too petty. This is not the serious political issues that we discuss at the United Nations. And I said, I don't know. If you have, you know, it, the UN might be perceived sometimes as, as, as lacking power. I think like it can't stop Ukraine. Let me, let me give you a word to the wise. They're not even trying to stop Ukraine, but that's another, but the one thing you can do is at first do no harm. The UN in Haiti said it was helping people and, and negligently brought cholera. They killed 10,000 people with a strain of cholera that comes from Nepal. It's not even disputed anymore, but they didn't pay anyone. So people in, in Haiti were left worse off with the UN than before the UN went. And I think that's, it's totally unacceptable. I think the, the countries and the taxpayers that fund the UN should demand that it not harm the people it's supposed to, they have sexual abuse. They have peacekeepers go and, and buy, not just buy prostitutes, which I'm not excusing. Children as young as five have been sexually abused by peacekeepers, real perverts, and nothing is done. There is no legal recourse for that child or its or his family, because it's as if the peacekeepers are diplomats, like diplomatic immunity. You can't charge the ambassador of France with, you know, because it would. And so a peacekeeper goes and rapes a five-year-old and they're just flown back to the country and nothing happens. So I started covering those kind of cases. And to jump a little forward, I, I, I started really seeing a lot of it will have to do with China. I have to say, I'm a quarter Chinese. I'm not anti-China. But I saw the way the UN is a it, many people there because there's so little accountability. I was going to ask if you were Asian, by the way. Yeah, I'm, I'm a quarter Chinese. So okay. long, my grandfather came from China. Then he I feel him. you. I feel yeah. you, brother. 
So it's, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I see the UN, I don't even blame China. If, look, if you were a country trying to dominate a region and you could throw a little money at the UN and suddenly they're doing Belt and Road festivals for you and not criticizing genocide of the Uyghurs or anything else, why not? But how can the UN be taken seriously when they're, they're these current protests in, Ch in China about COVID restrictions, they're not saying anything. The UN isn't saying anything. And it's because, you know, the most benign explanation is because the Secretary General needed China to not veto him to become Secretary General. But he's already in his second term. He's a lame duck. He has nothing to lose, but he's just congenitally a supporter of power and 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 just wants to kind of get along with, with sound bites about climate change when in the UN, a man, a man who was today pled guilty to bribery and will face five years in jail, was in, when I was in the UN, I wrote a story about it because I went to an event in a big room in the UN and this businessman, very diminutive, five foot two Chinese businessman named Kerry Yu was, was jabbering about uh, housing and climate change and give him money. And you could, I could tell there, I went to the website, there's nothing there. It was all just flim flam. And what it was mm -hmm. is if you get invited into the UN because you sponsor parties, you're an NGO, suddenly you can actually pay bribes right inside the UN building to develop oh like the Marshall Islands or like Antigua and Barbuda. There was another case here where, where the ambassador of Antigua and Barbuda the president of the UN General Assembly took paper bags of cash from a Chinese businessman from Macau called Eng Lap Sang, who wanted to be this guy, the G, president of the General Assembly, to fly to Macau and say, this casino that he was building is actually a UN convention center. And he wow. got it. The, the president of the General Assembly said, if you pay me $25,000, I'll fly to Macau. For $50,000, I'll show the UN flag. It's like diplomatic pornography. Like, I'll do it. And, and, and nothing has changed at the UN. I started pretty obsessively digging into and reporting these things. And, the, and the, 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 the response was to physically throw me out of the building. I not only, at first I, quote, lost my office where I used to work. And so I was like, you know, working in the bullpen and I had to leave at 7 p.m. Finally, they just grabbed me by the shirt, broke my laptop and threw me in the street. And I have not been back in that building since 2018 and and apparently i'm on a list of permanently banned people but the list is not public and i did nothing it would be as if i'd once gone in and like you know thrown a rock i, I did nothing basically for writing and questions i'm banned and there's no legal way to challenge it because they're not subject to the first amendment and countries mm -hmm. i'm going to now put down the biden administration countries they don't view the UN as something to be held accountable. They view it as a place to preen like a peacock and say, mm -hmm. look what a good diplomat I am. I'm working well with others. Or I'm, I, today we got the Security Council to condemn North Korea's nuclear launch. You know what that was accomplished by that? Absolutely nothing. Because they did another launch the next day. Like half of the, the you see media coverage that says the UN, you know, expressed concerns or, 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 or condemned something. And in 99 times out of 100, it has absolutely zero impact. And the people who do it know it has no impact. And the journalists that write it know that what they're writing is misleading and false. And nobody cares. The, the, the carousel just continues. Of, and then when you challenge it, they say, well, if it didn't exist, someone would have to invent it. Or it's the best we can do. Or I was at a church service this Sunday where the priest said, you know, we know the UN doesn't have the capacity to do what it was set up to do. It may or may not have the capacity. It doesn't have the will at all. The people that run it, in particular, the current Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, is a corrupt, thin-skinned, dictatorial censor. And that's, that's the problem. And he's Portuguese by nationality? He is, and he must have been better before. He was, he was elected the Prime Minister of Portugal. He was the head of the Socialist International. He's obviously a smart person. I don't want to begrudge him that. But the moment he got into the UN... He realized, I, don't have, I have to assume that if you're the prime minister of Portugal, you have to taste, face tough questions from journalists. Like you go out and somebody says, what about the budget? But not at the UN. At the UN, they handpick who can ask questions 
And if you shout out a question, it's, it's looked on very bad, very bad. But you have to. It's it, because the emperor has no clothes. You know what I mean? Like there will be. I'm going to give you. An, I'll give you an example. This Carrie Ann case today, it's UN related. The gentleman made the bribes inside the UN, but nobody inside the UN not only didn't ask the terrorists, they didn't even ask the spokesman Stefan Dujar. Nobody asked about it. They just live in a in a closed world in which getting canned quotes about about the West Bank and Palestine or about the Russian grain deal is all there is to ask. Nobody asks like, did the UN kill anyone today? What about the UN rapist? What about the bags of cash in the PGA's office? They just, mm -hmm. most of the media at the UN are state media and it's mm -hmm. their job to get a sympathetic quote for their cause. So an Indian journalist will say, do you condemn Pakistan's you know, most recent nuclear threat? Yes, we are deeply concerned. Pakistani journalist says, do you condemn India's treatment of Kashmir? Yes, we're deeply concerned. And all the UN has to do to keep the money train flowing is to say they're concerned. It's like ad libs. Whatever question you say, are you, well, it's our position that all people should have freedom of the press. Really? Because I was doing freedom of the press and I was thrown out. I've appealed. I had a law firm write to them. There is no recourse at all. It's a free, free press exempt zone black hole in Manhattan. Well, Mr. Lee, as a professional courtesy, if, if uh, you'd like me to write a, a letter to the uh, Secretary General of the UN and the officers, I'd be glad to do it. Okay, let's, we'll talk about that. I mean, let's, I have a petition up on, on the Twitter page. Yeah. You can see it has more than 10,000. I'm not putting it down, but... Oh, no, no, no. And I mentioned this is because that's really how power works. You know, there's an exchange of money tons mm -hmm. of money through bags, as you just explained. But at the upper levels of power, it's it's really professional courtesies that get the machine running. So we who have no money can right. use that technique. That is no, absolutely. I didn't mean to. I mean, I see, I'm a believer in the law. What I like is I'm, I'm here about, you know, 400 yards from City Hall in Manhattan. If I go there and ask a hard question, they can not like it, but they can't grab me and throw me out. And if they do, not only do I have to count on, can I count on, you know, the New York press corps to back me up, but I can go mm -hmm. to a court and a judge will say, what the hell's going on here? Like, mm -hmm. if, if it's based on what he said, you can't throw him out. But with the UN, there's nowhere you can go. There is no court that has jurisdiction over the UN. For much worse than my case, the Haitians or the survivors of the people they killed with cholera tried to sue the UN and they was thrown out of court. They said the UN can't be sued. So I blame, I blame those who signed this treaty in 1945 or six. Why would you set up an entity that has no legal accountability to anyone? That they was my to... next, that was my next question. It, since it doesn't look like you're going to be returning to the, the cubby hole, the bullpen at the Uni United Nations. I, 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 I continue to... applying every year's general assembly. I submit an application. I re maybe when Guterres leaves, maybe, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I haven't, I, I, okay. I don't mean to be a Pollyanna, but right. I'd but like to go there one day a week and say, let's, let's talk about the found, founding of the United Nations on that fateful yeah. year of 1947. There's United Nations Plaza in San Francisco, yep. 100 miles away from me. All right. uh, let me put it to you very simply. Uh, do you think, because a lot of people are coming to this conclusion that the United Nations itself is is a illegitimate entity that rests on literal bones, a graveyard of nothingness uh, donated by the Rockefellers. And uh, but no one really is challenging it on that basis. Legitimacy. Right. Institutional legitimacy. Um, and as a consequence, as you mentioned, they're unaccountable. So in your opinion, are they part of the problem? It seems like the oh, United well, Nations. Absolutely. The, okay. I think not only are they part of the problem, the, my only, the only way I would, and, I, and I, I speak to a lot of people to take a very, a kind of, I would call it a bigger picture. I don't mean, I obviously don't mean it in a bad way. Mm -hmm. I think it is, it, it, it is illegitimate in the sense it was set up by the victors. It was victor's justice, basically. It was set up by the winners of World War, World War II as a way to police the rest of the world. They gave themselves vetoes. So in the Security Council, so they can't be policed, right? So every, why has the UN Security Council been unable to condemn the Ukraine war? Because Russia has a veto. Why have they never spoken about the Uyghurs? Because China has a veto. Why do they really do nothing on, on Israel? Because the US usually, but maybe not, these would use its veto to say you can't condemn that. 
French mm -hmm. colonialism. You could go on right. previously UK colonialism. The only thing where I differ is that I, I decide rather than just go so big picture, I actually have experience. I have a person, I have kind of skin in the game. Like it's, it's, it's not even just that, that, because I think when you critique it from a sort of, I, I, let's call it a Trump perspective, let's say nationalism, it's illegitimate to have some far away cheese eating bureaucrats telling a country what to do. I think that's a good point. It's a fine point, but many people could say that. I'm going to say they don't even mean well. It's not even the things they say. I guess my what I bring to the to the to the to the to the table on this is that having been inside, there is not a single claim made by the UN which is not entirely contradicted by what they themselves do. They say they're for gender empowerment and they condemn the Taliban for destroying the schooling of women. And yet, when these peacekeepers rape girls. When one of their aid workers called Kareem El Karani drugged and raped 13 female aid workers, the UN covered it up. They didn't care. They say they're for freedom of the press. They'll issue canned statements about how could, you know, uh, you know, we can go around and around who they like to right. condemn. But um, this brings me to my next question. Yeah. You know, there's the it, question of institutional legitimacy, but yeah. given your background with a Catholic worker, they're not even legitimate at the metaphysical or spiritual yeah. level. No, no, I, I, I agree with you on that. I think it's just okay. that I see, you know, it's similar to, to what I was trying to say earlier about covering, say, even this court case today uh, of Trulia. I kind of knew from, from the two prior proceedings what I was thinking of it. But I don't, what I never like is to go so, I think you let, you let an, a, an institution like the UN off the hook if you just go kind of big picture, because then you just have two different sides. Some people love it and some people hate it. Agreed. It's, it's really okay. It's just that people love or hate it. I'm going to say like, I went in loving it and I've seen what it is. And it's not a, it's not a, it's not just a philosophical agreement. It's that right. in, in every detail, they had, a, they had garbage cans that were said they were for recycling. And I put my can in and then I looked in and all of the holes led to the same garbage bag. You <laughs> know what I mean? I mean, yes. there's not there's nothing that take that they have workers that that work serving the diplomats in a fancy restaurant on the fourth floor, and mm -hmm. when the season runs out, they lay them off without notice, no unemployment, nothing. Yeah. So they talk about workers' rights, right? They talk about the right to protest. I saw people come onto the grounds with a banner when they were doing some festival on the lawn, and, and they threw them out and said, "There's no right to protest in the United Nations." Well, how can you? Yeah. How could this? It have any credibility criticizing dictators that outlaw protests when they can't they can't handle a, a, a single investigative journalist that sometimes shouts out a question at the stakeout. Their only response to that is to first try to like make it impossible. I, I, this is this is this will show it all. When they first tried to throw me out, they did. They, people wrote to them. There were some articles written. So they said I can come back in, but I can't have the pass I used to have, which allowed me to go through most of the building. I can only mm -hmm. be in a small area. And if I want to go to the other areas, which are outside the Security Council, outside the Economic and Social Council, outside the GA, I need to have a, a minder, basically. I need to have an escort. So other journalists are able to walk up and down the hall. Sometimes they're walking around drunk. They're not doing anything. I want to actually go and stand in front of the, the, the meeting room and ask questions, not violently, not, not loudly, but just do a reporter's job. Mm -hmm. I have to go get somebody who will swipe me through the thing. And then they stand with, they would do this. Now, now I can't even get that. I used to make fun of them. They would stand next to me for two hours and say, who are you trying to talk to? I'd say, it's none of your business. I'm a reporter trying to like, let's say I want to ask diplomats, do you think that the UN Secretary General is corrupt? Let's say, mm -hmm. do I want to ask it in front of the minder of the Secretary General? This is like, a, this is like something out of you know, Moscow or Pyongyang. They didn't see it that way. So I started mm -hmm. mocking them. And eventually they said, OK, we're just going to throw you out and there's not going to be any. We're not going to have to explain why we're not going to. And then I got invited into the building by a mission. The mission had some. Maybe they didn't know they had a, they had a meeting on human rights. I got an invite in my, in my email. I, I write back. They say, come and pick up your past. I went. I picked up my past, just like any any number of people to go in. I went up to the front. and They said, no, no, you can't come in. You're banned. I said, when did that happen? Like, I'm no longer a journalist. Even as a tourist, I couldn't go there and pay $20 and go on the, the, the BS tour of the rooms. 
because they have a list. They have a list of people that are banned. But mm-hmm. I was never given a due process. There's, I've even asked them, show me the list. There is, they, can, they won't show it. So it, it feels very kind of uh, totalitarian, very autocratic, very, mm-hmm. then again, I'm here in the, in the SDNY courthouse and I'll say, when I walk through, when I leave the building, I see that they have a photo array of people banned. Now I'm assuming that if you ask them, there'd be a reason, you know, they ran at the guards. But whenever I see things like that, I'm always very, I take them very seriously because it's, and I think most people that I talk to, most people that work there, kind of writing or journalists, they assume like if you're on that list, you must you, you must have really done something bad. They don't. Mm-hmm. There's not this. I, I I tend to identify with the people that are that are are put on the list because I know what what it is. I, I didn't do anything. Like people that come to court and are like, you know, this is terrible, and no one hears me, and it's like people are like, oh, this guy's crazy. No, there's a lady who stands in front of SDNY all the time. Everyone's like, she's crazy. I, said, I want to hear what she has to say because mm-hmm. if mistakes are made. Even when there's a law in Pride, and there's, when there's no law and there's nobody watching, mistakes are more frequent than, than, than correct answers, you know? Okay. Now, I just wanted to, I flashed this graphic on very briefly um, a yeah, few yeah. minutes ago. Sure. Uh, just to, to reiterate, uh, the, the current Secretary of General, Gutierrez, Portuguese by nationality, uh, you said he's a member of the Social Democrats of Portugal, something like that. He That's the inter- Socialist International. He's Socialist International. Inter- that is yeah. the symbol, by the way. Yeah. The fist holding the roses, that is the symbol of the Socialist International. Yep. And that is going to take us into the, the, the case of one Kevin Spacey. Okay. All right. Because as you know, the, the, the film, the Academy Award winning film that brought him to prominence was what American, American Beauty. Beauty. It's a right? good film. He's a very good actor. I mean, I think he's a good. I think he's a very engaged. He's a unique. Maybe it's due to his other issues, but he's a, he's an interesting actor. I have those nothing are, against him. Those but, are American yeah. Beauty roses, and that's the actress Mina Suvari on a bed of American Beauty roses. There's a whole metaphysical uh, mind game that they're playing there. And here's your book here, American Beauty, and I'd like to have you talk a little bit about how, who is uh, Anthony Rapp and how did Kevin Spacey beat the rap? And also, if you could address the question, I think this is a sort of like a form of meta theater. Yeah. There's the oh, court trial yeah, itself, but it's meta theatrical. Please I mean, go I'll, ahead. I'll put it in sort of in context here. Like the big, since I've been here at, at SDNY, which is three years, the biggest case, that, that drew interest and cameras outside every day was the Ghislaine Maxwell and the, and the Jeffrey Epstein case before Jeffrey Epstein died or didn't die in jail not far from here. But people saw the Kevin Spacey case as related, like you have it's a high profile Me Too case. So there's a lot of interest in it. It has the, the, the quirk or the extra, it's a, it's a, it's a um, you know, same gender Me Too case. And the allegation was, and the case, I was covering the case, although no one actually thought it would go to trial. Most, most civil cases don't, but there was litigation back and forth. In fact, initially there were two, he, there's many more accusers against Kevin Spacey, but in, here, in, here in the Southern District, there was a case of two, two individuals, Kevin Rapp, who at the time was a young actor. And I got, during the trial, I got to know him. His allegation was he was from the Midwest. He got, he, he was a kind of a child star actor. He had a, he had a, he had a play on Broadway and and he was in his mother was kind of a stage mother and brought him to New York and he was staying in New York and he went to backstage to meet at a, a, at a play and, and met Kevin Rapp. And according to him, Kevin Rapp invited him and an older friend of his from the Midwest to the Limelight Club, which was a nightclub at the time in a church, and then back to his apartment. And he claims that when he was so young that he didn't he didn't stay drinking with the others. He went into the bedroom, was watching TV. Suddenly all the adults had gone and Kevin Spacey jumped on them and ground against it. That was the allegation. And so under a, it was a long time ago. This was in the eighties. And he was 16, was he? Uh, yeah, he was underage. He was, there was, there, he was underage, was and Kevin Spacey was something like 26. 26, 28. Yeah, 28 and, something like and, that. And, and as, as people may remember, when, when these allegations came out, Spacey tried to sort of diffuse them or confuse them by saying i'm coming out as gay and a lot of people in the gay community didn't like that they were like you can't just come out as gay the day you're accused of sexual harassment and think like you're going to suddenly have a community with you but i have mm-hmm. to say that kevin spacey 
he was he took the stand. This was not like, you know, most criminal trials, the defendant doesn't take the stand because they're going to speak and then they're going to get cross examined. It's, it's not going to work. <laughs> Sometimes they do. Usually they don't. Now, that's where the meta theatrical intervention yeah. took place. Please comment. Yeah. I think he won. The I dialogue. Think he, if I, I think he analyzed. Commercial. Very I think quick, he analyzed I'm the jury. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I got to give a commercial for you. Some okay. of the dialogue in your own book here, American Ugly, is worthy of something. It, it, you know, Aaron Sorkin could have wrote the dialogue that you transcribed. That what right. I try, and I have to say, sometimes people will critique. I, what I try to do, I, I really try to be extremely accurate, but I obviously don't type every single word. So I have an ear. I have an ear. So I, I've, I've transcribed like monster. I, I, lo I love a good court proceeding where you're like where, Truman Capote in, in really, cold no, it's, blood. It's, and the only thing is that I think. And again, I, I'm not Truman Capote is a is, you know, but <laughs> I live tweet these things too. Like I'm not. To me, what makes it really fun is to in in real time send out the news of like this is what's being said. And both both mm -hmm. factually because people want to know who's being accused of what. Like particularly in the Glenn Maxwell case, everyone's like on the edge of their seat, like who's next, Bill Clinton, or, you know, it's like, there's all this hype. But to me, it's, it's, the, de it's the, the telling details that people say of like, oh, that she's a nobody or, you know, like, and, and Kevin Spacey was, I have to say, he was very engaging. He had, he had a lot of repartee with his lawyer. He pretty much on cross-examination, he wasn't beaten down. And Kevin's rap testified as well. And it, he's, a, he's an actor, but there's something about Spacey and maybe, First thing Spacey said on the day when he took the stand is, uh, I've always been a very private person, and it's because my father was a Nazi and a white supremacist. Which yes. I heard that before. It was like, oh, shit. yes. And it turns out this had been written about by the day. Like, it had been out there, sort of, but he said it out of his own mouth on a court stand. And I think it really engaged, like, and it was true. The, more, the only thing is that his reaction to this his father apparently went and fought in World War II and became enamored of Hitler, came back and was a kind of writer manque. It was like constantly saying he was going to write a, a book, but never wrote a word. He said, if I can't get the right pen or the right something, something insane. Mm -hmm. So he was very angry and he, you know, he may be sexually abused, both boys. Nobody quite knows. But Kevin Spacey reacted to this by just disappearing and disavowing the whole family. Mm -hmm. And, and, I guess becoming, you know, what they always say is sometimes the, 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 the victim becomes the perpetrator. Like, right. I think it's, it's possible if I were, a, he got his own, you know, he got his own yeah. $600 an hour psychiatrist to say this for him. But the reality, he didn't want to say, he basically said nothing happened. You know, he's never done anything wrong. He didn't, he didn't try to take, I mean, he might have a point. Maybe most of his targets were over, were people not underage that maybe worked as, you know, set constructors on House of Cards. That, my understanding is he would like demand sex from those people and mm -hmm. many of them would do it. Maybe they wanted to keep their job. It's, a, it's an ugly, it's a, it's a Hollywood thing. But he, you know, he, 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 he denied to no end that he'd done anything wrong. He thinks that Kevin Rapp had a bad memory. Kevin Rapp was, was jealous of his infatuation with his overage friend from the Midwest who testified basically against Kevin Rapp, just did a deposition from England saying, I like mm -hmm. Kevin Spacey, you know, Kevin wasn't interested in Kevin Rapp. So was that John Barrowman? Yes, that's correct. And that one, I think that might've carried a lot of, it's impossible to really know, but I think that it's bad when your friend turns against you. These people say like, you know, they know you better than we do. They don't, mm -hmm. but, but you know, the, 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 and then the lawyers for Kevin Spacey were vicious. They were like, you were, you were a child star, but your career really never went anywhere, did it? So weren't you jealous of Kevin Spacey as he became this acclaimed award-winning actor? So they kind of portrayed rap as like at Oscar parties, throwing pencils at a TV screen, you know, saying like, and then adding in like, he raped me, but he, didn't, he ground against him at some point 30 years ago. I'm not trying to be dismissive, and I think sure. the you know it's it was an it, it, it was an interesting case, and it's one where it's something that I initially wouldn't have thought it was interesting. You know, I try to be like I'm, I'm interested in disparities between you know crack defendants and North Korea and crypto, but this was like a, a it was a, it was a theater, like you said, it was amazing. The dialogue was amazing. I think the issues of like the other thing was this: 
there were, when I covered the Ghislaine Maxwell trial, even though people say she was a very powerful person, has very powerful friends, she's now in jail for you know 20 years. I didn't get a lot of Ghislaine Maxwell fan mail. I mean, I don't mind getting it. I like, usually, I like to write about things where there's passion on both sides. And I will mm-hmm. say in the Kevin Spacey one, there was more, there was some passion on his side. There were some people that said like, he's a good actor, this guy's lying, or this wasn't enough to bring a lawsuit 30 years later. And I can, I can absolutely respect those views. I don't, I, I prefer to cover a case where I'm not just like beating a dead horse, like Epstein is a pedophile, let's hear more about it. It's true, but mm-hmm. I, like, I like a kind of a more nuanced case where it's like, sure. like even this Trevor Milton case, I, people hated it. Yes, he lied. He told investors that he had hydrogen stations and that he was, he'd already done a lot of things he hadn't done. But from his perspective, if it's, it's like the lady from Theranos. If you're going to do something, you've got to like shoot for the moon. Sometimes you've got to fake it until you make it. And I can oh, okay. see that. Okay, wait a minute. Before, before we range too far afield, I want to get into the nuance, uh, some of the Please. nuances of the Kevin Spacey trial that you covered okay. that you might not have thought about, but I, it, sure, it really I started to ring bells. What is Kevin Spacey was the assistant to the renowned New York theatrical producer and impresario Joseph Papp. Correct. And you mentioned yeah, it's that amazing. it's a very small world. What, yeah. what are the impli- Is it more than a small world? Are we talking about an underground parallel system to uh-huh. what we civilians think is Broadway theater, but is really sort of a, a beauty passion for the super elite gay community, just like Victoria's Secret shows was, was a beauty pageant for super elite heterosexuals run by Leslie Wexner and Jeffrey Epstein. I think that's, no, you're absolutely right. You're, I mean, there are definitely roads I could have gone down with there. I think what I, mm-hmm. I think it's a good, it's, it's a totally plausible uh, hypothesis the way it came up, it came up kind of indirectly. He he claimed, Spacey says he really had no career. You're right. How did he get this job? Suddenly he was working at the public theater. And they Joseph Papp. Yes. Yeah, he jumped over somebody's desk. and atta- One guy came and testified that Spacey came in in tight-fitting jeans and jumped over the desk at him <laughs> 30 years ago. But what I, I, I have to say, the only thing that I had, they described this campaign of actors trying to save some of the theaters around Times Square. Right. And I went back and Googled that. I found it really, I found that interesting. Like it was, I think Kevin Spacey is different than a, lo- a lot of the, the, bro- the, the Hollywood actors in that he kind of styles himself as like a real actor, right? He became the head of- A thespian. A theater, yeah. And, and, and you know, I mean, again, I, it's not for me to say. I, he's an, I actually think covering this courthouse, sometimes the, 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 he's a, He's a larger than life character. I think he's a pretty twisted character. I think to give him a little bit of credit, the guy today, the crypto guy said he, you know, he had that he was adopted by two gay men and that he has autism and that's why he shouldn't get his jail sentence. And he did pretty well with that argument. I hmm. think if your father is a Nazi and a white supremacist and sexually abuses you, you've definitely got some 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 credit in your in your in your moral bank, but do you spill it on the bed on Kevin Rapp? I don't I don't think you should. I think that but that's not what the jury thought, you know? Okay. It's really about crafting stories. Uh, and as such, I got to ask you this. Mr. Lee, have you been approached by Netflix? I, not, I, it's funny. I have not. I've seen, I've, I've gotten calls from like people that are, say they're producing a documentary and what I like, right. you know, mm-hmm. advise them. There's a, cause there's a, I, I really find that, I actually, I find this form of sort of like a, uh, Binging true crime. It's a very interesting form. That's the new, right. you know, I think the one, the only one that I'm, I'm actually kind of beating the drum about, I'd love to see Netflix take on the UN. That would be, see if I, as much as I enjoy these cases, there are other people interested in going back. So I see you Netflix. as a showrunner on the level of Aaron Sorkin. No, I, I mean, I love these things. And I wish, I guess I'm saying, for example, I'm covering this, this incredibly hype and interesting uh, Honduras drug the president of Honduras is in jail in, in Brooklyn and on trial here in Manhattan, former president, for, for being an outright drug dealer. And I'm sort of, I keep using the hashtag Narcos Honduras. And I have a lot of, every time he comes up, a lot of people in Honduras are like, yes, this is the guy who's going to, because they really should do it. But the thing is that he's not as high profile as Pablo Escobar. Or, you know, it's, I think it'll happen. I like, I like and, and you had mentioned it with the books, I like this kind of, hyper realism. I like something, I have no problem with a dramatization where 
as long as you label it as such, as long as you label it as such, like this is, here's the dialogue. I try to do it by breaking it into sections. Sometimes I use italics. Mm -hmm. I, in, during the trial, I put up real news on innercitypress.com and I put yeah. up more other things on Patreon because I don't, I also don't, and, and some people say, you know, wait a second, you're undermining journalism is supposed to be just the facts. All I know is most people saying that are not even digging a lot of facts. They're just running with the crowd. Right. I try to, I, I view it as like, if I'm covering a trial and there's nobody else there, I'm just going to do the facts because it deserves that. If I'm mm -hmm. covering a trial where there's 50 journalists waiting every day, I'm going to do it in, in a different way because I think that there's, mm -hmm. it allows space for a different approach that really says, you know, and not, and I sometimes, I have no problem being perceived as like defending, defending the defendant because it's too much to just go in and be like this, this guy's a real sleazeball. Like, I mean, I, I found myself wondering, I like Kevin Rapp. I thought he was a victim. I do mm -hmm. wonder whether, whether even as he alleged it, I think there was no, like, maybe it really did traumatize him, but I think, I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what the solution to a 30 year old, you know, uh, inappropriate come on in. Is it a million dollars? Is it $20 million? Is it, I don't know what it is. But I can see why some people would say, you know, get a get a life, you know. And it's sad to say that, but I can see that. And, I, and I, most people that wrote to me are totally me like, "Thank you for giving a voice to Kevin," and I want to. But I also I have to be honest and say, like, I don't know, you know. There, let me give you an example. I I covered a case that nobody else covered of a crack gang on Long Island that turned these women who were crack addicted into like four times a day prostitutes and, and tried to put bags over their head. And, that's abuse. There's no, you know what I mean? Like, and yeah. nobody cared. So why did the media care so much about a certain kind of victim and so little about another kind of victim? Is Are we really concerned about sexual abuse or even child sexual abuse when UN peacekeepers are doing this to like children in the Democratic Republic of Congo and people don't even, you can't even get a question asked at the UN about it? Or is it, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, I don't want to, you know, that's beating a dead horse too, to talk about racism and hype. But what I try to do is rather than criticize others is to like cover that, 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 that Long Island case and try to make it interesting to people. Try to say mm -hmm. like, check this out. It's interesting. Like the, the same psychological dynamics between Kevin Spacey and Kevin Rapp are like mm -hmm. 10 times more between this guy and, and, and the woman that he picked up and, and took to some ranch style house. In Absolutely. Long Island. And, and it's, it's hell. It's a hell out there. You know, not on Long Island. But, you know, to house. put it in a historical perspective, I think, Mr. Lee, your voice is uh, the most innovative uh, intervention in what is now discredited mainstream media and indie media. Since no, we, so, I, I really, well, wait I, a minute. Well, let, let me let me finish. Like, let, let me finish my my praise of you. It's the most original voice that we in America have heard since the 1960s. New journalism, people like Truman Capote. Norman Mailer, uh, Hunter S. Thompson, right? Tom Wolf. Okay, we have we've been missing this for decades, and that's why I was so excited to come upon your work, and I want to support it. I want to get younger journalists who are really truly involved with social justice, not the one the, the fabricated ones they're learning at the university, which are corporate controlled, just like the environmental movement, right? Now tell us, are you accepting uh, uh, interns at uh, inner city? Sure, I, I, I mean, I, I absolutely. When people come down to the court, the only thing is when you first come to this courthouse, they're going to take away. This happened to me for like six months. They'll take your phone and your laptop before you come in. But I've, I've tried to show people the main thing to do is to like go to the courtroom and just start covering it. So absolutely. When people write to me, I, I, I actually, because there's you know only some people are in New York. So I'm more than, I have a kind of a, uh, a not an aid package, but a sort of a pointers for how people could do similar coverage, you know, certainly anywhere with a federal courthouse, but every state is different. The same thing. Well, there's there are, no federal, lack, there are federal districts in San Francisco and Los yeah, Angeles totally. are all over the country. Totally. I, and I, I think only I had one. to say one phrase, I, I don't want to, I can't sum up the, the approach, but I will, I mean, you know, magistrate's court, go to, go to the, where the rubber meets the road. Okay, and, and, and everything will go from there. And try to report on as much detail as you can, and don't don't let an editor or even your your you know your patrons 
decide what's important. You've got to go and look and, 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 and hopefully if you do it right, you're, it's not trying to, you know, proselytize anyone. It's just to say mm -hmm. like, these things are interesting. If people are interested in human dynamics. It's not just the Kevin Spacey's of the world that are of interest, you know? Right. Well, that's incredible. Now I, d I did have to ask you about, uh, a commonality between the Maxwell or the Epstein case and uh, Anthony Rapp. You noted uh, just in passing that Anthony Rapp had attended the Interlochen Center for the Arts. Yes, correct. I, I did notice that. That I didn't really know about that until the the the, the, the Maxwell trial. That that. Do you know that Kevin? Uh, uh, excuse me. Jeffrey Epstein had his own little cabin there and had was bringing these prospective artists there. So I agree. There, it's the kind of thing that that. If, if I weren't so wrapped up in day-to-day -day reporting, I, okay. it's the kind of thing maybe for a fiction, because I, not a fiction, but an exploratory thing. It Leave does that seem to me. Very, yeah, please. It does I'll seem pick. very, I've, I've gotten a lot of emails from people that went there and said, like, there's more than you know. And I'm like, right. yeah. no, it was Kirby Summers who, who uh, revealed the Epstein Interlochen connection. Yeah, incredible. And, uh, Interlochen is a feeder to all these elite institutions. Again, it's kind of like Broadway theater. It's like Victoria's yeah. Secret catalog. Yeah. Right. No, that's really, um, absolutely. That was really that was a fascinating. The, the, that's what one thing about trials and just court cases and even filings in general. The level of detail that comes out. It's really you know it's one thing to sort of say generally. I think you know the UN's corrupt or there's a bunch of pedophiles. But to really get into the nitty gritty. Of like, yes. oh Lord, how did this happen? And who knew? And who knew when? Like, you know, it's 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 very. That's the that's what I really appreciate about it. What gets me up in the morning? I think it's the you know, there's the material is so rich that like by day by day you can do news out of it, and and by night you can turn it into you can try to raise it to a whole different level. Uh, exactly. That's what I'm trying to do. Now I do have to ask you about page three, where you mentioned the dual thrones that were. Occupied uh, by Kevin Spacey and Ghislaine Max. Is that literal that thrones? Was, yeah, well, I, I think what so, it is. Is that is an that, occult initiation or an occult marriage? I think or? that was in one of the palaces. Ghislaine Maxwell, Kevin Spacey was in London, and Ghislaine Maxwell was showing him how much access she had. And there, I mean, as she would do later with Prince Andrew and them. She was saying, like, her at a certain point after her, her you know, her father jumped off the boat and stole the pension funds. Like there was a need for funds, but her main asset was these connections all the way up to the royal family. And so I, that's my understanding of the, of the, of the origin of that, uh, of, you know, of that photograph is, the is dual is throne. Kevin's I've been trying to find it. Yeah. Dual thrones. It's, uh, the the yeah. dual game of thrones. Yeah, totally. But did you no, know, I, mean, you? Actually, I was, I had meant it. I mean, yeah. it, it all comes full circle. When I was in the UN, before I knew much even about Ghislaine Maxwell, I was covering the UN. But I did heard, had heard of Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell as a kind of provider. They let her come into the UN and do a press conference for something called the Terramar Foundation. She was portrayed not as a pedophile panderer or whatever, a procurer, but as a, a head of an NGO about the oceans. And, 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 and she was fed and nobody said anything. So I went to the press conference and said, what about these charges? What about this guilty verdict in Florida? People, what? <laughs> this is not what we're here for. And Antonio Guterres, the current Secretary General of the United Nations, the man who would tell you that he 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 feels so bad that he took the job from a woman. He's for gender equality after he's gone. He had a representative, one of only five, on the board of directors of Ghislaine Maxwell's Terramar Foundation. Only five people on the board, three of them wow. are whom are his relative, her relatives, and one of whom is was Amir Dosal of the UN, the representative of Antonio Guterres. And so I've asked repeatedly, why, how, what? And, and their answer is, they don't even answer written questions now. Their answer is, if, if you come back in so we can, you know, tear your arm off and break your computer again, because mm -hmm. it's, it's unbelievable. It's, uh, they have a correspondent in every day's UN noon briefing, which I write about, who did a fundraiser with Ghislaine Maxwell. And they don't, I'm not saying they should pillory her, I'm just saying, how can you have an organization that says it's it's against abuse when they're celebrating funding and seeking representation on abusive with abusers and right. trying to physically ban any any coverage or or questioning of it? That to me, that 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 also gets me up in the morning. Okay, Mr. Lee, is there a term that uh, working reporters uh, who cover these uh, stories? 
let, let me show you a very brief clip, three seconds sure. worth. Okay, just for, is there a term that, that uh, you guys have for, for these scrums or these gauntlets where you, you shout out questions to them? <laughs> No, I don't no, know. But it's sort of fun. It's, it, I'll tell you the most interesting was when, when, when Michael Avenatti, now in jail, was a defendant here. He would always talk. It wasn't, it wasn't like that. It wasn't oh. like shouting out. Like people oh, okay. get so used to Spacey going to his, to his black car and not answering that they'll answer like, how was the salad? Or, you know what I mean? It's any goddamn thing. Avenatti right. would have a, a walking press conference every day. So I didn't. Like Aaron know, Sorkin I, walk and talk. Yeah, it was incredible. I did one where you could look it up. I put I put up the video where he was he had some story. He lied actually. The, the prosecutors ended up using what he said in his <laughs> sentencing memo because he claimed that his father had sold hot dogs in 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 L.A. in in the in the Dodgers ballpark and told them you can you know put broken hot dogs together under mustard, no one will notice, and that's what the, the prosecution's case is like. They were like, no, no, your father owned a beer distributorship in sort in St. Louis. You're a pathological liar, you know. And they, 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 I put the video on Twitter. They like literally had like a Twitter link, you know. So it's just, it's, I, I like it. I mean, it's, 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 it's also kind of builds collegiality in the press corps. Like we're, out, you know what I mean? You can't be too on the air. We're, we're, we're just, if you're gonna, there's a, there's a moment for paparazzi. There's a moment for like, look at this, look at this, look at the spectacle here. You know, we love that pop. Fellini esque paparazzi. Yeah, no, I mean, I like the idea that, like, the sort of like, 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 uh, I don't like, you know, the journalists that are far, so far up in the career. Like, I have no desire to be a commentator. I like reporting. I like going to the courtroom. Some people don't understand. They're like, I'll send other people out to the courtroom and I'll sit back and like write my deep legal analysis. I have deep legal analysis, but what I like to do is to see what's happening in the courtroom and then write it later. You can do both. It's not one or the other. There's no loss of face. I'm going to cover on uh, next Friday, December 9th, I'm going to stake out a, a corrupt UN event held in lower Manhattan and I'll do it. And they'll be like, Whoa, you're really not getting anywhere. If you're still out here, like putting your phone, your film. And, and it's like, no, I want to ask that. If no one else will ask it, I'm going to ask the question. Why didn't you say anything about the world cup in Qatar? Why didn't you say anything about these protests in China? What about the UN rapists? What about Terramar foundation Maxwell? And I'll, mm -hmm. and I'll ask the questions until my voice is hoarse and, and it's, 20 degrees, and then I'll go and upload it from uh, some coffee shop down there. Wow. I really respect you, Mr. Lee. <laughs> and now, I see it just because I know it'll happen. I'm not trying to. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there, and so will uh, thousands and okay. maybe hundreds of thousands very soon as this video starts to circulate. Because this is the real, this is the future of journalism well, in America yeah. and around the world. That's what you represent to me. So before we leave, again, your Patreon slowly, Patreon address, uh, sure. all the information we need in order to support you, subscription information, please. Okay. Yeah, I think that the way that it's, it's, it's pretty seamless to sign up for $5 a month is patreon.com slash Matthew Russell Lee. That way you can pay. You can go to intercitypress.com and has a PayPal link if you want, if you prefer to do it that way. If you just want free, free, free stream of, of courthouse information, go to Inner City Press on Twitter. As long as it remains, you know, <laughs> what it remains up and remains what it does. I actually I've revived this Instagram account just because I I do every day a, a legal kind of day ahead vlog in the morning, about two minutes, mm -hmm. two minutes twenty seconds, whatever goes onto Twitter, and I put that on YouTube. So it's YouTube Inner City Press. If you just do my name or Inner City Press. And if you want to help, you can definitely find a way to do it or to, and you can read any of the books, you know, which are, you try to keep them affordable. You can read them ebook or you can get a hard copy, but they're all, they're all well under $10. Excellent. I have one request. When Netflix comes and approaches <laughs> you to be the showrunner for your own series called uh, the UN House of Cards, yeah. please consider me as uh, for the position of, um, research assistant. Okay, definitely. That would be great. We'll go all the way back to the beginning and, and into the future. We'll flesh all this stuff out. Yeah. Okay. It's, it'll be um, amazingly entertaining and inst and instructive to the I American think, public. I think, there, I think there's a there's a there's a show there and that we'll All right. Okay, Mr. Lee, I'll see you at the top. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you me. ladies and gentlemen for watching. Share this video all over the place. It's so important. I really appreciate your support. Support Mr. Lee in all his endeavors. He is the future 
of American journalism. No hype. All right. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.